You know, I, I, uh, I have to laugh because um, all the times, uh, like at our church, you know, I'll ask somebody to do something, and they'll be like, oh, pastor, I, I, I can't do it. Uh, and I'm like, they said, I'm not like you. Well, first of all, how do you think I got like me? Whatever like me is. But, you know, they think that, that because we minister the gospel that we're just, you know, we can just fly into anything and do anything, you know. But the fact is, I mean, what, I, what my purpose is in life is to raise up disciples. So we've been very fortunate. We started our church. We're going to have our first year anniversary here pretty soon. Um, and uh, I, I, we're all excited about that. Actually, our first year will be the week before Passover. Now, we have church on the first and the third and the fifth Sunday, if there is any. And uh, so we don't meet every Sunday. So we're going to miss Passover and our one-year anniversary. And then we'll have Easter. Uh, and then we're going to have a celebration for the Christ. And then we're going to have a potluck dinner to celebrate our uh, one-year anniversary. Well, you know, everybody thinks that the pastors, the presenters, you know, we just fly into it. We've been so fortunate. This is the reason I'm telling you. This is, this is you guys, I think you have a really good setup here. Uh, we are so fortunate that I haven't been sick in the last year on the first, third, or fifth Sunday. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I can't say the sicknesses come from God like some of them. I, you know, I, I, I don't. All I know is, is that when I got COVID, I got it in between services. I did. All right, I, and then when I, when I was sick, I was sick in between services. And I said, God's God, and I'm telling my congregation, that's because God knows right now that, you know what, I, I just asked some people last week, and one of the brothers said, oh, because I said, hey, you know what, God's been blessing us. I said, but, you know, we can't ask him, I cannot never get sick. I mean, I would like that. But the probability of that is, is kind of slim to, to that I'll never get sick. I said, we need some men and women to step up and to be, this is it, make disciples. And like I said, one brother said, mm -mm, not me. Another one said, mm, I don't think, Pastor, I'm ready for that. Well, you know, it, uh, I, I know you minister and you minister, and I'm sure Arnie must minister too. And uh, uh, You know, you've got a number of men and women, and I'm listening to you, it's very, very well um, gifted in the scriptures so it's it's nice to have that uh, pray that I don't get sick right now okay <laughs> and, and if I get sick again may it be in between the services you know but um, thank you for inviting me back I, I won't uh, take up too much time uh, with my meanderings but I, I want to meander just a little bit I, I went to a church one time I'm 72 I went to a church one time, and uh, they had me scheduled for two Sundays in a row. And I went there the first Sunday, and uh, that Monday morning, the, the, one of the elders called me, or the deacons called me, elder called me, um, and he said, uh, oh, hey, uh, Brother Philip, you, you know that uh, uh, second Sunday that you were supposed to speak? And I said, oh, yes, sir. He said, forget about it. I said, what? He says, uh, we, we, that's okay. We don't think you're a fit. So when you invited me back, I thought, hallelujah. <laughs> I said, Thank you, God. I, I had waited to 70-something years old to get that, uh, not that I wanted it, but to get that kind of rejection. And then, I, you know, it has me a little paranoid. So I came last time. I, I came, and I'm like, well, look. Debbie, let's see what happens. You know, that was a pretty strong message, and da-da-da-da-da. But, oh, when I got the text, hey, would you like to come back and visit? I said, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> mm. If you want to follow along with me, which I hope you do, I'm going to be in the book of Luke, and I'm going to be in the book of Jude. I'm going to be in the book of Luke, and it's going to be Luke 23. And, you know, this is our, our, our uh, Easter series uh, season, so I think a lot of attention is going to go, be going to that. But first, let's just read the scriptures. 
Luke 23:39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged uh, who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, "If you are the Christ, save yourself and us." But the other one answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for, our, for we receive due reward in our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I've always loved that scripture, that portion of scripture. And then Jude 20 through 23 is another portion that we'll look at briefly. But, uh, but you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. I got that underlined. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. Some translations, I think I remember reading, defiled by the smoke. But whether it's flesh or smoke, these people are on the edge of something, and it says that they should be pulled back from it. I think that is awesome as we look into this. This is really all about Jesus, right? This whole season is. It's about Jesus. And one of the things that as we look at this scripture, we have a tendency, right? Many times during this Easter season, we have a tendency to think of what Jesus went through, which is very important. I mean, uh, we focus on the beatings that Christ took for us, the number of slashes and strikes, uh, the cat of nine tails, uh, how he was whipped. I've, I've done that myself. Uh, I've, I've put a lot of emphasis on that, the cat of nine tails. Uh, uh, I think Mel Gibson, didn't he do just a super job? Did, you, did some of you see the passion of the Christ? And then, that, oh my goodness, when I was watching that, it was hard not to let your heart and uh, tears come to your eyes. Uh, um, I probably was in my 60s or 50s or whatever in that era when that came out, and I, it still just overwhelmed me. And, you know, I've had a life of being in a prison where I've, I've worked amongst prisoners and inmates, and I've seen some things happen. I don't get too rattled by it, but, you know, when I seen them beating Jesus the way they beat Jesus, it, it made me step back. And then I, as I tried to grasp hold of the reality of what this movie was depicting to me, trying to get me to see, I was just kind of overwhelmed. I'm a grown man sitting in tears, trying not to let nobody see the tears that might have been rolling down my face because, like I said, we're still grown men. You know, we, we want to suck it up and, and, you know, talk about how much dust is in the room. But so... I, had, I, too, have looked at that. I thought Mel Gibson's uh, uh, examples or his movie was uh, of that scene was just staggering. I know as we approach his death and resurrection, there will be sermons all around, uh, around this world talking about how he descended into hell, which is important, obviously how he ascended into heaven. We've all looked at those, and we've probably written some of those amongst us in this room. I always liked, I always liked talking about the veil that, uh, that was rented in two during Easter, I mean, during his death. He said when he died on the cross, my God, my God, Eli, Eli, Samathabid, uh, why, why have you forsaken me? And it said that the veil was rented in two. And I mean, it's the power of God. You know, they used to talk about those things being woven out of this special wool. God, don't let me overdo this. Like, but I, and if I remember right, horses, they couldn't pull this apart. It was so strong. But when Jesus Christ, as we know, as believers, when Jesus Christ died on that cross, 
His blood covered the multitude of sins for this world. Bam! That veil was rented in half. And as we know through Jesus Christ, we have access into the Holy of Holies. Mm. I mean, that just always just meant something to me, Steve. I just always loved that. Oh. And then, he's, and then I'm, I'm going down a rabbit hole. Excuse me. I'm going off on a topic. Then he says in Hebrews 6, 19, this hope that I have in Christ locks me in where? Anybody in the scriptures know what I'm saying? Where does that hope in Christ lock you in? Hebrews 6, 19. He says, it secures. Brother, would you look that up? Say, I'm, I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm going to give you it right out of the word of God. That way you know that I'm not just ad-libbing and that I'm not stretching and I'm not being the evangelist or, you know, uh, to bring that word to you. What is it? Hebrews, I believe it's 6, 19. I just, I just like that. He says we have this hope in Jesus as an anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters in behind the veil. You remember how the high priest could be the only one that could go into the, the temple? And if he didn't have his uh, game together, they drug him out. Do, do, you, do we remember that, or am I just sounding crude to you? No, they used to tie a, a bell. The, the, all the high priests that went into the Holy of Holies, they put bells on them, and they would put a rope on him. And when he would go in to represent the whole nation of Israel, if he did not have his life in order, his family in order, the people in order, if he was like Eli, it's a good thing Eli wasn't the one that was, that was mandated to go into the Holy of Holies when Hophni and Phinehas were acting a fool. So they used to take a rope and that priest, would go in to sprinkle the blood to cover the sins. If things were out of order, they didn't hear the bell. What would happen when they didn't hear the bell? I, I like that. I like my sister there. She goes, she goes like this. <clears throat> exactly. And so they knew not to go in there and get him. They would drag him out of the Holy of Holies. Listen. I've just gave you a sermon amongst sermons. You and I can go into the presence of God any time, any day, any minute, any hour, any moment that we want to because we know Jesus Christ. We're under the blood of Jesus Christ. You and I can go into the Holy of Holies. I am, and you know what I, I, I like? An anchor does what? It secures you. God wasn't confused. He used those words for a reason. I'll let you work your salvation out with fear and trembling. I can't tell you what to believe. But you know something? If God says that I'm anchored in because of my belief in Jesus Christ, the day that I asked Jesus Christ into my heart, I became eternally secure because of I can't undo what Jesus did. I have come under the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't worry about losing my salvation. I don't live like hell. No, don't get me wrong. And don't be offended by hell. I mean, because hell is hell. And I don't live that way. I try not to. I make mistakes, yes. But I don't do anything by the grace of God, I say this. I don't do anything. And God's not going to discard me. He says, who I have in my hand, Father, when he was praying for them in John, he said, they, I will not let them go. So in the hand of Jesus, I think that would make a good picture. You know, I, I wish I was an artist. We could have the hand of Jesus. And you guys could do the same thing if you wanted to, but I'd like to see this little black figure right there. 
amongst all these hundreds of thousands of people, I'd be right there poking out my head. I'd be like, hey, I'm there. I have to apologize to my wife sometimes. She's like, oh my goodness, Philip. <laughs> but really, and you know what I hope? I hope to see you and Kurt right over there. I'll be, oh, hey, hi. We're right in the hand of God. I will not lose my salvation. I, that's me, and again, I won't, I won't uh, uh, labor that because that's not what I'm here to labor. <clears throat> well, I told you I was going down a rabbit hole. Uh, so what I want us to see again is I want us to look at another point about Jesus and another point about this holiday. The fact that Jesus loved us so much. You see, he loved us so much that he died for us. It, we, if you want to, to turn to Timothy, uh, what he said was 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Now, I'll just turn there so that we can read it together. Um, Ephesians, Timothy 2, 1 Timothy, here we are. What did I say? 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God does not want anyone to perish. And it's very important that we remember that. You know, we are so e eager or so willing to help God send people to hell sometimes. And that's not what he does. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He doesn't want people to deny him. Jesus and the Father says, I wish that all men, all men, and you know that's inclusive, ladies. I wish that all men would be saved. Everybody would. Now remember that too. So here we see him in this aspect. This is another aspect of this crucifixion that sometimes we don't look at. We see all the whippings and the beatings, which are significant, but we don't think about the fact that the reason Jesus went through that is because he wants us to have the opportunity to come to know him in a very personal way. And Jesus as an example, shows us how we should not stop reaching out, even unto the end. Because in, back to, to Luke, uh, back to 23, Verse 43, and Jesus said to him, well, today, today, he said, today, Jesus wants everyone to be saved today that, that can be saved. And, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm speaking to the choir, I hope. I hope that everybody here knows Christ as their personal Savior. I hope that everybody here is solidified, solid, not worrying about losing their salvation. That everybody here knows Christ in a personal way. And you know that your soul is locked in behind the holy of holies. This, this, so, and when I say I'm speaking to the choir, you know what I mean. But there's a reason that we're here today. There's a reason that we're in the choir seat. There's a reason I'm reiterating something that you probably know. I need just to remind you of how valuable you are. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went to the cross so that you would have the opportunity to know him in a personal way. Fortunately for all of us in here, we know Christ as our Lord and Savior. So now he went to the cross, we have been saved, and now there's something else for us. And you say, Pastor, what is that? I'm not telling you. <laughs> Yet. But Jesus Christ was our example. Let's go back here from 43 back to 39. And I want us just to take note of something that I think is uh, very interesting. 
Verse 39 says this. And then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him. And I think this is interesting because this one criminal was in the process. He was committed to death. He, now, listen, this is very important. He was committed to dying. He's on the cross. He's ready. He just haven't, hasn't lost his breath yet. He hasn't lost his consciousness yet. And you know what happens? He has the audacity to be defiant. Dying. On the, in the process of dying, he has the audacity to say, if you're the son of God, get us down from here. You know, if I'd have been Jesus, I would have went, yeah, 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 yeah. and you stay in there. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> That's my man. That's the human part of me coming out. You know what I mean? I, he, Jesus didn't come down from the cross, but he didn't come down from the cross because he couldn't. He didn't come down uh, from the cross because he just wouldn't. He didn't go to the cross for a religion. He, he didn't go to the cross for a cause. He went to the cross for a people. He went to a cross for you and for you and for you and for you. He didn't go for a cause. He didn't well, I think we need to fast more, pray more, eat more, sleep less. No, he didn't go to the cross so that you could be healthier or not healthier. He went to the cross for a people, not a cause. He went to the cross for you. So, as we look at this, here's this, this I almost call him an inmate. Here's this thief who is being defiant and telling Jesus to come down from the cross. And Jesus, uh, you know, paid him no attention, obviously. He was on a mission. Like I said, he wasn't, it wasn't a cause. But then it says this. It's just like, and then he blasphemed. I looked up the word blasphemy. Where is that at? I looked up the word blasphemy. The act of offense of, or, or offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God or about a sacred thing. He blasphemed me. He got snotty nosed defiant with God. I, I, isn't that amazing? I think, please hear me correctly. It's not that I, this is what I want, but I think there's just going to be some people that are just going to go to hell. I've heard people say things like that. I'm, you know what? I'm going to hell. I can have beer and be with my friends. Got news for you, buddy. You wish you could have some beer in hell. Like the king wish that Lazarus would just come with one drop of water. You remember the story, the parable? One drop. Abraham, just, just br let him bring one drop of water over here. I mean, people don't know, hell is no joke. I don't normally, you know, I, and I'm not today, I don't normally go around talking about hell, hell, trying to scare the bejeebers out of somebody to get them saved. That's not what I do. I want to present the love of God, then you'll be drawn to the love of God and you'll want to know the love of Jesus and you'll come and open your heart to him. But some people, you know, they're just they're de hell destined. They won't acknowledge God for nothing. I don't know who they are. Sometimes I think I know who they are. We have a member of our church. Well, I call him a member. He comes to our Bible study for sure. But, uh, and he said he was a devil worshiper. He said, I worship the devil. He said, the way that, that, that we praise and love God now, he said, I had that same love for Satan. I just, when I hear him say that, I just kind of like, you know, how could you? Ooh. But you know what? When somebody's under the influence of, of uh, whatever, self, alcohol, drugs, whatever, they make a lot of stupid decisions. And you know and I know, Satan's right there to encourage stupidity, isn't he? He's right there. 
whatever that stupidity is, whatever it is that pulls you away from your true purpose in life, Satan's right there to give you a, hand, a helping hand. Let's look at verse 40. <clears throat> so this person was committed. He was rebellious in 39. He said to him, if you're the Christ, save yourself. But the other one answered and rebuked him, saying, Do not you even fear God, seeing we are under the same condemnation? He's saying, you know, we're going to die here, man. What, what, are you, what are you talking about? You know? He's saying, we're getting what we deserve. Verse 41, And, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. The due reward. You know, so many times... People think that they're even getting away with stuff when, they're, when they, they, they come to, to Christ and, you know, and Christ talks to them about their cardinality through the scriptures or through the Holy Spirit, through the pastors, deacon, elders, brothers and sisters, you know, or just reading the word of God. All of a sudden they get convicted and they go, that's just my little sin. There's going to be a due reward because God talks about the fact that we are, going, we are held accountable for our deeds. And when we pass over to the other side, there'll be a day of reckoning. My salvation is secure now. My deeds will be judged there. That's why Paul says that there's crowns of life and that our deeds will go through the fire and that some are hay and they'll burn up. Some are jewels, some are gold, and some are silver. The dross will come out of my life through the fires and every service that I've ever done in the last 45 years will be presented to the living God. And the things that I did in the flesh, they will not last. But the things that I have done in the spirit, they will be presented to Christ. And I will be able to take what I have from the life of Philip Jackson and I will present it to Jesus Christ as one of my crowns, he said. Am I talking to you this morning? Do you understand how you in this portion of scriptures? Do you remember reading some of that? Everything you are is for the glory of God. And you know what? Don't get me wrong. I will take our Harley Davidson. It is springtime. And I will go 100 miles an hour. I have to do that every year. It means that I'm a man. I take my Harley, I go down the road 100 miles an hour. <laughs> and then I'm good. Then I'm good. No, are we perfect? No. Remember what Betty told me? I never told her about that story, but remember when uh, I was uh, working at a church in, in, in Stillwater? And I was late. I was leading the worship and doing the welcoming, you know, like you did this morning. You open up, and you know, and like last time you did the worship, you know. Well, I was doing that that Sunday at our church, and, and uh, I was late, and I went above the speed limit to get to church. And I was making a joke of it, and I told the congregation that. And after church, this lady walked up to me, and she said, you know, you fell out of God's protection. What do you mean, Betty? said, the moment you went over 55, the angels got off your car, and you were on your own. I thought, wow, you really believe that? But I didn't say that portion to her, but in my mind I did. I thought, do you think God is going to drop me because I did 58? There'll be no hope for me in another couple of weeks. <laughs> when that sand gets off the road, I'm out there. And we just bought a new three-wheeler. Whoop, shum, laka, laka. I'm going to be out there. But she believed that. Let me move on. So, verse 42, I see, and he indeed justly, they're getting with that due reward. For this man has done nothing. I want to take you to a different little setting now. We're still talking about this Easter. We're still talking about the crucifixion. He says, but this man, this one thief, he says, this man has not done anything. And then verse, <clears throat> excuse me, 42. 
Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me. When I was reading this, and even this morning when I was rereading it and writing it, and I said, that man had a Lord come to meet, come, Lord, a God moment. See, he addressed God as God. This man, he didn't even address God as God. Let me thank you, Holy Spirit. I've got to back up. He was talking about Jesus, but he looked at the other thief and he said, don't you even fear God? But then when he looked at Jesus, he had a Lord moment. His next word was, Lord, remember me. Who else had a Lord moment? Acts 9, verse 5. Paul, he was riding his high horse to Damascus. He was killing saints. He had just got through being a witness to the death of Stephen, holding the coats of those who stoned him, and he was crucifying the church. And Jesus stopped him on the road to Damascus his high and mighty self. With his letter of importance, he's going to the Roman or going to the synagogue. He's going to tell them what he's going to do to the Christians. We're going to imprison them. We're going to kill them. And Jesus said, Paul. He didn't say, who is this? He said, Lord. Who art thou, Lord? What, Lord? I mean, it was Lord right away. He had that God moment. Lord. That's important. Paul had that moment. Lord. Let's go back to verse 43. And Jesus said unto them, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, if we left it right there, wouldn't that have made a nice sermon for the day? To be uplifted, to be encouraged. I've got ten minutes left. Well, I didn't know I was going to use this much, this much time. Uh, uh, and that would make a good sermon, but I, I can't stop there right now. I've got to take you someplace else. Just, just bear with me for a minute. You know, I've got to take you to a place... He wants us to pick up uh, uh, at the cross also. I mean, he wants us. Let me see if I can read this. Jesus was an example for us. Now, what does an example do? It sets an example. I mean, Jesus is our example. Now, what do we see Jesus doing? Verse 23 uh, up here, but the other, otherwise... The same pulling, oh, no, 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 no. Let, let, me, let me take you to Jude. You turn to Jude. While you're turning to Jude, I'm going to turn to Jude too. <clears throat> he was an example to us. And I want to show you, because see, Jesus, and I won't reiterate what he was going through, Jesus was also at the verge of death. He, this is how magnanimous his actions are. Look at how he was being beaten. Look at what he had went through. Now he's nailed on the cross. He's dying. How close to death is he? He's very close to death because you go from 43 when he told the, 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 uh, the uh, 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 criminal, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then, excuse me, verse 43, he's breathing his last. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Just in those verses, Jesus gave up the ghost. Why is this important? Because what I'm telling you is that Jesus never stopped reaching.
He's covered with blood. He's been beaten severely. His flesh is hanging from him, exposing bone. And he's got a crown of thorns. He's half naked. And he's dying. And he never stopped reaching. He never, oh, he, he never lost his vision of reaching mankind. And he set an example. And let's look at this quickly. Because I do want to be aware of our time. Jude 20 reads like this. And we've read this. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and have some... and. On some have compassion, making a distinction, but to others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. Now as we read this the second time for this day, is there a different viewpoint on it now that you see what Jesus did? Our example that we have to, to our last breath, check this out. We have to reach down. There are people that we don't know are going to be saved. There are people that are on the edge. Even, look at that. Did you get that picture? He said even reaching down, grabbing them, and having them smell like hell. Mm. Mm. They have the smell of the world on them. He said, reach him. Now, you know what is very interesting, too? He gives us some guidelines. The first thing, you know what? I don't know who to reach. But he said, praying in the Holy Spirit, right up there. The Holy Spirit's going to tell us. Uh, if you run from the Holy Spirit, you're running from the direction of God. Mm, 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 mm. Let me say that again. If you are eluding the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, now God, they might not invite me back, but if you elude the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, I didn't say you got to break out in tongues and prophesy. I'm telling you that he says here that they have been praying in the Holy Spirit. Now they're praying in the Holy Spirit to know who they reach for. Because I don't know as a man, but the Spirit of God knows. And he says, here, touch this man, touch this woman, grab them. They don't even know who they are yet. But they're not destined for hell. Help them until they realize who they are. Now, am I making this up? Can you see that in the scripture? In Jude, that's why I said Jesus was our example. But the others save, pulling them out of the fire. Jesus, facing death, in his last moments, reached out to a lost soul. Uh, can you imagine looking through the blood, the sweat, the dirt of carrying the cross? The anguish, knowing that you are going to die within minutes. Oh. And his thoughts are about someone else. His thoughts are about a lost soul. And we go back to, to, uh, to Luke. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. I want to encourage you, church, to reach out to the lost over this upcoming season. It might be family. It should be friends. It might even be a stranger that you just look at and can't stop looking at him or her. And you just feel compelled. And everything in you says, I, 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 I can't do this. Yeah, you know, like when I asked some of my congregation, they said, you know, you guys, come on. Pastor, pastor is going to possibly need a, 
uh, a weekend here sometime soon, uh, or, you know, a Sunday. You know, fortunately, God has been... Um, am I going to jack up this mic now? I heard it kind of crunchy, crunchy under me. There we go. Um, you got to know that you are the person that God's going to use. That you are the person that he keeps extending to someone else. You are his messenger. And, and you don't know who you're going to reach. But the Holy Spirit knows. You're praying in the Holy Spirit. You mean the helper? He'll come, the helper. And Jesus said, I'm going to send you a helper. You know, I've felt and sensed the Holy Spirit since I've been in this room. And, and, and uh, you know, I haven't broken out in warts. I haven't ran up and down the aisle. I haven't got to wailing in its tongues. And, uh, no, it's just, you know, you sense that, ex you sense the power of God. You sense something. You know, it's, it, I, I don't know. Do you understand? Do you, uh, do you follow me? Do you, have, you, you know the Holy Spirit, some of you. You, you sense it. You feel it. Sometimes you're like, well, is that the air conditioning? No. That, that is the move of God. He's moving around you. All right. <clears throat> you know, when I, I wrote a song about umpteen years ago, <clears throat> and it was about these two men. It's really about one of them, but and the love of Jesus and how gracious he is and how he has not stopped. The only thing that stopped him was death. And now when I say that, don't don't go into a theological taboo thing for me. I'm not talking like that. The thing that stopped him from reaching out in the flesh that day that he died was that he died or he'd still be reaching out bloody hands swollen beaten but now we're his example and we're to reach out for him I wanted to sing the song I wrote <laughs> I didn't know what was coming it's about that thief on the cross I didn't know what was coming I didn't know what was coming I didn't know I didn't know I didn't know Beginning the day I heard talk of my death a long walk up a hill and shackles of steel. I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Beatings on the way from the guards' heavy hands. Talk of broken legs and nails in my hands. I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. When I looked in his eyes and I 
seen the light A place I'll call home And mercies I've never known I had not seen this coming I had not seen this coming I didn't know I didn't know I didn't know Sweet Rose of Sharon And the streets of gold Loved ones pointing the way To God's glorious throne I had not seen this coming No, 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 no I had not seen heaven coming I didn't know I didn't know I didn't know So if you're like that thief on the cross You got up thinking that your life was a total loss Continue to look at Jesus Christ Because he's the author of your eternal life I had not seen heaven coming, no, 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 no. I had not seen heaven coming. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know, no. I had not seen heaven coming, no, 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 no. I had not seen heaven coming. I didn't know. I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. seen heaven coming. That thief on the cross had not seen. Can you imagine to his surprise? He got up thinking he was a dead man. And God in his mercy offered him eternal life. Please. In these ugly days that we live in, hardship that we go through. I want to encourage you. Don't give up on yourself and don't give up on people. Some of them think they're dead already. And so they think that they'll just live like hell because they're dead. But like those men that we've seen in Job, at jo Jude, excuse me, when God has sent you, when he sent you, when everything that we see and think says no, he says go, no, go. We had a testimony just last week at church. I'm going to turn this off. Wow. Can I turn this off? Well, I don't need to turn it off. I'll just make a little noise. Uh, we had a testimony last week at church. The lady asked if she could share something, and I said, absolutely, because I trust her. I know that she's not an you know, airhead. And uh, uh, did I just say that out loud? She's not a threat. You know what I mean? She's, I don't have to worry about her getting in the pulpit and taking off somewhere about seeing angels floating around the room. But uh, um, I said, sure. And she, she came up and she shared how her brother who was sick, and he's back home in hospice. Uh, this is just, what, a week and a half ago? Well, yeah, because we had church last Sunday. Uh, that prior week, um, 
someone and went over there and gave him like a little medallion, Jesus first thing, and, and uh, talked with him about Jesus. And then her brother died the next day. He accepted Christ that day, not knowing he was going to die the next day. And I've had that happen to me too. You know, a week later, after sharing the gospel, and it's not me sharing the gospel, but a week after I'd shared the gospel with this individual, they went over to the other side. And I've known that to happen a week, a day, six months down the road, they went to the other side. Be encouraged, church. We don't know who those people are. And sometimes they don't even know it. And this is the important thing. They might resist you. I grabbed Debbie. They might resist you all. They might be dangling around the edge of the pit. You know, when I, when, when I wrote, uh, read that portion of Scripture and I, I visualize it, I, you know, he said, pull them from the edge. Pull them because their clothes even smell. I, I, I see them dangling around the pit and we're supposed to walk over there and pull them into everlasting life. Who? The ones that the Holy Spirit has been guiding us to. Because I don't know who. Don't give up on the Holy Spirit. He is the third person in the triune God. And Jesus said, I will send you a helper. Don't give up on yourself. You are that instrument for Christ. And don't give up on that third party. Everybody here know Christ as their personal Savior? I hope so. I hope you know Jesus, that he's in your heart. Because there's work for us to do. There's work for you to do. So if for some reason, if, if you know, if you're doubting in your heart, I, I got a feeling maybe we're not, you know, everyone here knows Christ. But if, if you have a thought that, you know, I don't know if I'm saved, let's pray before leave. I'll linger with Howard and Steve. Let's pray. Brother, I think you're going to close this up. Okay, that's what I was going to do. Uh, let's pray. Father, we love you. That's the first and foremost. And then we acknowledge you, Lord God. We thank you for the mission that you put before us. And Lord, let me back up even from that. Let me thank Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. That in not a moment, but in a lifetime of need on this earth, you never stopped reaching for mankind. Thank you, Lord God. We love you today. We bend our necks to you today. We ask you to visit our house, our souls. We thank you that we're locked in to your presence. We love you. I guess that's all I can say, Jesus. We love you. We love you so much. And we're so thankful.